Part 1. Listen to Sanjay talking in a tutorial about the digital divide and answer questions 1 to 4. So, Sanjay, I asked you to find out about how the villagers of Virampatinam are managing to bridge the digital divide. Uh, how did you get on? Oh, I found it very interesting. Virampatinam is a small village on the east coast of India, near Pondicherry. That's south of Chennai. Now, this village, in the year 2000, had no telephone connection and no electricity supply. It was just the sort of place which we'd expect to be completely left behind as the technological revolution rushed ahead. But that year, they had an internet connection installed in the village, and now, each day, a local volunteer in the village checks for information, which is useful to the villagers. Really? But how is that possible if there was no telephone or electricity? Well, quite simple, really. They installed a solar panel to provide the power, and instead of an old-fashioned telephone line, the internet connection was provided by a wireless transmission system, all very high-tech. And then what does the volunteer do with the information? Print it out in a newspaper? No, that would be far too slow and expensive. He just picks up a microphone and broadcasts the information to the whole village using a public address system. You know, simple ideas are often the best, and villagers can hear what they want to know while they're having tea in the local cafe or doing their shopping. They don't even have to go to a meeting. Before you hear the rest of the tutorial, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. So, what sort of information do these villagers get from the internet? Well, I'll give you a few examples. Virampatinam is on the coast, and quite a lot of the villagers are fishermen. From the web, they can find out what weather conditions will be like the next day. And if they know about the weather, they know whether it'll be safe to go fishing. This internet connection can actually save lives. Now, that really is remarkable. Another useful application is that they can find out how much crops are selling for in the markets of Pondicherry and Chennai. You see, a lot of the villagers earn a living from farming, so you can imagine how useful that is. Also, by looking on the internet, people can find out about jobs which are on offer, and then go and do them. This, in turn, brings more money into the area. But wasn't the system very expensive to install? How did they manage it? The system was the idea of M.S. Swaminathan. You may have heard of him. Wasn't he the man behind the Green Revolution? Yes. He did his PhD in plant genetics at Cambridge in the 1950s. Actually, he was a major force behind the Agricultural Revolution. The Agricultural Revolution largely solved India's food problems, and his foundation designed and paid for this installation. When you think about it, it's a much cheaper solution than installing electricity and telephone lines to the village. Though those will come with time, I expect. Do the villagers have the know-how to use something as sophisticated as the internet? Well, the technology is sophisticated, but the internet itself is very user-friendly. That's why it's such a powerful tool. And it's very important that the people who handle the information are not technicians from outside who have their own interests and priorities, and certainly not civil servants, who might tell the villagers what they think they should know. No, it has to be the local people, who know what information they need, and can look after their own interests. I'll give you an example. You remember I told you one of the pieces of information which villagers want is how much crops are selling for in the markets? Well, 
If they get this information, then they're in a much better position to negotiate with the intermediaries who come to the village to buy their produce and may tell all sorts of stories to get prices down. Well, that's true. So once again, it proves the old saying that information is power. Thank you very much, Sanjay. That was very good. Well done. My pleasure. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk about a pool and outdoor venue created by some people. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Hey, if you're just joining us on WKPX The Sound, welcome. We're here in the studio with Matt and Cam in the morning, and this morning we're talking about keeping the kids occupied on summer vacation. Folks, there's a new kid in town in the world of summer fun. Get ready for the Pool of the People, a pool and outdoor venue created by, that's right, the people. Scheduled to open in November, the ideas for everything from the design of the pool right down to the items sold in the snack bar have been decided upon by a sample of 1,050 members of the public. The public selected two top proposals from over a dozen created by renowned architect Ned Mosby, and the final design is truly something else. The pool is shaped like a fishbowl, sinking down into the ground, and there's, you guessed it, a real live fish tank in the centre. It's certainly the centre of attention in the Bridgewater area. Now, you are probably wondering how much an extravagance like this must cost, right? Well, have no fear. At just £15 for adults and £10 for kids, it's an affordable way to entertain the kids in those dog days of summer. The only problem now is the possibility that it will in fact become too popular. The pool is only so large, so swarms of people coming to enjoy it may cause quite a crowd in its first summer of opening. There will be an opening party for a select audience, and in line with the pool's mission, the people have decided on all the arrangements. They collectively decided on actress Rebel Wilson to host in the festivities scheduled for later this month, and even dictated the playlist by ranking their top ten songs from a list of hundreds. There is some discrepancy, however, on the sculpture design for the foyer at the entrance. The people elected a jellyfish sculpture to greet entering visitors, but given last week's vicious attack by a box jellyfish on a local youth, coordinators fear it will bring too much fear to patrons. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. The theme of the clubhouse is set to be International Waters, with a different section representing each continent, designed by the legendary local artist Roberta Anuzzi. Representing Asia in the reception area will be a mosaic made up of prominent animals indigenous to the continent, a camel, a panda, and the Siberian white tiger, to name just a few. 
in the West Lounge, feel the cool icy vibes of the Transantarctic Mountains of Antarctica. Makes you cold just thinking about it, doesn't it? Just seeing a wall with a mural of the glacial mountains is almost enough to cool you off on a December afternoon. Almost. Why not make the trip to the pool a social studies lesson at the same time? The theme in the ladies' lounge room for Africa may not be what you expected. A safari? Drum music? The Nile River? No. Did you know that Africa was home to the first jewellery? I sure didn't. By contrast, as you may expect, North America's theme for the card room is as modern, even futuristic, as it gets. Anuzi created for North America a sort of absurdist print, interestingly juxtaposing the moon landing of 1969 with an abstract depiction of humans living on Mars. Seems to me like an interesting commentary on the future of space exploration. And in the men's lounge room, the ancient forts of Sparta, Rome, Greece and other European civilizations fittingly exhibit the strength and combatant characteristics of these societies. Finally, the cafe and breakfast room area is an enchanting round room that draws all attention to its centre, where there is a strikingly realistic sculpture of a volcano. The delicious food may actually be only the second most exciting part of this room in comparison to the nine-foot statue, complete with brightly coloured molten lava to characterise South America. Honestly, it is like a museum visiting each room of the clubhouse. Why not make the trip to the pool an educational one for the kids? We're going to take a quick commercial break here at WKPX, but we'll be back in 10 with more on what's touted to be the summer's hottest place to beat the heat. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students called Jimmy and Kathy talking to their tutor about the current research paper. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Before we start, Jimmy and Kathy, thanks for coming in today to talk about your current research paper. Well, I will also give you some suggestions for your future presentation later. That's great. OK, I've read the introductory chapter, and so far I like where you're going with your research, you two. Thanks. What did you think of the procedure section? I haven't got there yet. I'll get to that and the results and discussion section in a bit. Oh, if you haven't read the rest, are you just saying you like the introduction? No, the layout is really well done. You have each section clearly marked and have the header and footer perfectly formatted, and your title page is right on the money. A lot of students have trouble with that one. To be honest, we did refer a lot to the example we received in class. That's good to do for spacing and layout, as long as you're not also copying the information. The background information is a little sparse, though. You may want to add to it. You think so? I was more worried about whether I had enough data. You definitely need more background information. I would think about finding some more online articles or doing more research in the campus library. That's a good idea. We can go tomorrow. I find it too tough finding the subject matter in the online journal database. 
I also like being able to flip through the physical journal as opposed to trying to scroll down on a computer. Me too. Oh, I almost forgot. I've included all of my citations in the abstract, but could you help me with the bibliography? I should be using a bibliography, right? Not an appendix. Sure, I can help with that. Yes, for this type of scientific research paper, list all sources that you cite in the body of your paper in a bibliography. Go to the website I gave you last time to see the exact way to list each source. Okay, thanks. I'll do that. We still have a lot of things to fix up. Yeah, but there's a lot of good stuff here to work with. So, enough about the paper. How is the presentation going? Well, it's all right. I'm going to go try out the new presentation software while Jimmy's working on the bibliography. Yeah, we are hoping to make an animation of an actual pump, but still have a lot to learn about how to do that. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Who would have thought before we started this project that we would be able to recreate the motion of a pump? This stuff is just so interesting. So glad to hear it. Yeah, I am glad I took engineering this semester. I would definitely like to keep up with it. You know, there's an organisation called the Machine Engineer Society. You should look into joining it. You'd need to score well in your engineering class to qualify, but I think you can do it. Hmm, interesting. I will definitely check it out. I would really like to get in contact with some professionals in the engineering field to find out more. I don't really know anyone in the field now, though. I think if you keep meeting people in your classes and professors, you, you'll be able to get in contact with some really helpful people. Well said, Jimmy. If engineering pumps is something you both are specifically interested in, Make sure you stay up to date on new developments. In fact, you could visit the local water treatment facility periodically to see what new developments are going on. Hmm, that may be a good way to get some practical experience. Well, I don't think they would let you handle any equipment by just visiting the facility. If you really want to get your hands dirty, so to speak, I would recommend instead seeking a summer internship. Wow, you have so many helpful suggestions for getting a leg up. Now, if only you could tell me how to get my work published. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Well, honestly, all you really need to do is, once you have a dissertation, present it. Present it often and to many audiences, and once you get feedback, adjust it. You'll get published one day. Wow. This meeting has been truly inspiring. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture about Iron Age in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
Today, I'm going to introduce to you a special age in Britain, the Iron Age. People at that time, you may be surprised to hear that, seem close to the men and women of today, because archaeologists discovered that they tried to vary their diet, improve their homes, and follow fashions. The period known as the Iron Age lasted in Britain for about 800 years, from 750 BC to 43 AD. There had been several dramatic changes by the end of the Iron Age, including coinage, wheel-thrown pottery, etc. People had started to live in larger and more settled communities. Furthermore, because of the differences in climate and geography, someone living in Yorkshire or Ireland would have eaten different food, worn different clothing, and lived in different housing conditions from someone living in southern Britain. Caesar commented that Britain was a land of small farms, and this has been proven by the archaeological evidence. Since Iron Age society was primarily agricultural, it is safe to presume that the daily routine would have revolved around the maintenance of the crops and livestock. Small farmsteads were tended by and would have supported isolated communities of family or extended family size. They produced enough to live on and a little extra to exchange for commodities that the farmers were unable to provide for themselves. For those farms, harvested crops were stored in either granaries that were raised from the ground on posts, or in bell-shaped pits two to three metres deep. Some 4,500 of these storage pits have been found within the hill fort interior at Danebury in Hampshire, and if they were all used to store crops, this would have essentially made the site one large fortified granary. Although the archaeological evidence shows that cattle and sheep would have been the most common farm animals, it is known that pigs were also kept. The animals would have aided the family, not only with heavy farm labour, in the case of the cattle, such as the ploughing of crop fields, but also as a valuable form of wool or hide and food products. Horses and dogs are also observed in the archaeological evidence from both faunal remains and artefacts. Horses were used for pulling two- or four-wheeled vehicles, carts, chariots, while dogs would have assisted in the herding of the livestock and hunting. Besides agriculture and stock raising, the architecture in Iron Age is also worth mentioning. A very well-preserved settlement has been discovered at the site of Chiselster in Cornwall. It was made up of individual houses of stone with garden plots. In Wessex, the typical building on a settlement would have been the large round house. All of the domestic life would have occurred within this. The main frame of the round house would have been made of upright timbers, which were interwoven with coppiced wood, usually hazel, oak, ash, or pollarded willow, to make wattle walls. This was then covered with a daub made of clay, soil, straw, and animal manure that would weatherproof the house. The roof was constructed from large timbers and densely thatched. The main focus of the interior of the house was the central open hearth fire. This was the heart of the house to provide cooked food, warmth and light. Because its importance within the domestic sphere, the fire would have been maintained 24 hours a day. Beside the fire may have stood a pair of fire dogs, such as those found at Baldock in Herefordshire, or suspended above it a bronze cauldron held up by a tripod and attached with an adjustable chain. The ordinary basic cooking pots would have been made by hand, from the local clay, and came in varying rounded shapes, occasionally with simple incised decorations. As for eating, bread would have been an important part of any meal, and was made from wheat and barley. The dough would have then been baked in a simple clay-domed oven, of which evidence has been found in Iron Age houses. The barley and rye could also have been made into a kind of porridge. In addition to this, the grain was also fermented to make beer, and the surface foam that formed was scraped off and used in the bread-making process. The interior of the house was an ideal place for the drying and preservation of food. Smoke and heat from the constant fire would have smoked meat and fish, and would have dried herbs and other plants perfectly. Salt was another means of preserving meat for the cold winter months, but this was a commodity that could not be made at a typical settlement. Well, you can see that Iron Age people lived a decent life, didn't they?
I'm going to introduce their culture and leisure time next time. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.